everyone to this One Dance UK Returning to Dance webinar. My name is Erin Sanchez. I am the Health, Wellbeing and Performance Manager at One Dance UK. In this webinar, we hope to address frequently asked questions on risk assessment and responsibility when hiring a venue, legality, including liability and insurance, cleaning, and we will also be signposting to relevant UK government guidance and providing an opportunity to ask questions. A note on the context of these webinars, please remember that public health is a devolved issue. Any references to government guidance or roadmaps for returning to work in this presentation are specific to England at this time. Guidance for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales is yet to be published. Government guidance will evolve with science and it's important to remember that no one has all of the answers as medical and scientific understanding of coronavirus disease is developing. We aim through these webinars to provide a space to consult with experts, raise questions, identify issues, and share practice. We also aim to support practical implementation of government guidance across the dance sector to help everyone to return to dancing safely. These webinars are supported by our Dance Medicine and Science Expert Panel. This group of knowledgeable professionals input in all of our work for dancers' health, well-being, and performance at One Dance UK. Just a note on how to use this webinar. We will try to address as many questions as possible live during the session. And all questions will be answered in writing and made available on One Dance UK's website for everyone to access following the session. There are two ways to interact with this webinar. The first is through the chat box in the bottom center of your screen. This is where you can discuss anything that you would like with other web webinar attendees or with panelists. You can also ask questions via the Q&A box, which is also at the center, lower, lower center of your screen. This is where you should put any questions for any of the panelists. Please try to avoid adding questions for the panelists to the chat box. Without any further ado, I would like to pass you over to our Deputy CEO, Christopher Rodriguez. Okay, great. Thank you, Erin, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. Yeah, I'm Chris Rodriguez, the Deputy Chief, Deputy Chief Exec at One Dance UK. Um, thanks hugely for joining the second in our Returning to Work webinars, where today we're looking at risk assessment, legality, that's li liability and insurance, responsibility when hiring a venue, and cleaning. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our panel. That's Jasmine Chalice, Dr. Nick Allen, and Dr. Roger Woolman, taking the time to join and speak to everyone. And equally, a very warm welcome to all of you online. Now, here at One Dance UK, we're the sector support organization for dance and also a membership organization. So for you, we advocate the needs of dance to parliament, funders, education, and other bodies on matters concerning children and young people, diversity, health and well-being for dancers and the wider society and advocate for professionals including freelancers if you're not a member although i'm assuming everyone would eagerly want to join one dance uk and would all want to be members then please join together we're really very much stronger all right and moving on to today's stuff so the uk government published guidelines for reopening the performing arts that allows live live outdoor performances from last saturday as you know, theater and concert halls were recently open, but um, with no live performances. It's stage three, it's actually stage three of a five-stage roadmap where sometime in the future, 
and when it's safe to do so, the UK government will allow live performances indoors with social distancing for audiences, and that will be stage four. And stage five will be the final stage where there are performances indoors, but with fuller audiences. And as Erin said at the top, this guideline really only applies to England, even though Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales are probably going to make um, announcements soon about reopening the performing arts, and it probably will be similar. So if you're joining from, from the other nations, then it might be very useful to, to get an advanced look as to what might happen. However, one of the things that's happened with all the reopenings, whether it's, it's our, uh, gyms or offices, um, warehouses, it really uh, requires the employer to prepare a written risk assessment. And that's for anyone employing more than five employees to show that you've addressed COVID-19. Um, we have a template from Health and Safety Executive that we'll share with you, along with a notice to put in your spaces once complete to say that you've complied. And Erin has found some other very good templates um, to fill out that risk assessment. Now at this stage, which is stage three, some key things matter in your risk assessment and perhaps things that are similar when returning to work, rehearsals or training. And these are one, social distancing remains at two meters. That hasn't changed in spite of all the discussions about one plus one plus. It's at two meters except where you make mitigations, such as increasing hand washing and cleaning of common touch points like toilets or communal areas. If you can't maintain two meters distance, then keep activity time as short as possible. Use back-to-back -back or side-to-side -side working rather than face-to-face. -face. Uh, where you can use screens, and that might be protecting your front of house staff or your office staff. And consider fixed teams working. So that is one group of people who will work with each other um, and not really mix with, with other parts of the um, of the organization. So if we take something that might be, let's just say performing arts and might be three or four shows that are possible, then you would keep the cast of one show as a fixed team and not mix with cast of other others. And that means also too that you have to consider how you get people in and out when they're finished with one space, how you clean it, um, that nobody's left in waiting rooms, they don't come across each other. So it's a lot of planning. The next thing you have to consider is ensuring that those who can work from home, work from home. And I think also to at this stage, you can try to consider as well how much you use technology. So for example, stuff like doing casting and auditions, try to do those online rather than face-to-face, -to, -face, to just to reduce the face-to-face -face contact. Um, another thing is ventilate spaces as much as possible. And these are simple things that, such as opening windows, opening doors, but these have to be um, non-fire exit doors. And if you have air condition, which has been a concern that's been raised by a lot of people, the suggestion is to ask engineers, so that would be people who own the building, um, ask engineers to change your air condition if it is a closed air circulation, to have it draw air from outside. Now, in terms of risk assessment, the same principles apply to your audiences or attendees. So whether you're running or hiring venues, you should consider social distancing and matching capacity to that. Because lots of people want I keep asking, is there, a, is there a certain figure? Is it five people that are allowed? It really is depending on the size of the hall. If you can maintain social distancing, then you actually consider the size and reduce the size to, to the amount of people that can fit within that. So it's about matching capacity to social distancing size. And then also consider how common touch points are safely managed and communicate this work to your audiences before they participate to build their confidence. So it, as troublesome as it might seem, it really is a very positive thing when you let uh, your audiences know in advance, actually as part of your marketing, the work that you've done to reduce uh, COVID-19 or address the risk. Finally, there's test and trace for visitors and staff. Um, this matters because people coming into your building, even if those who might open their cafeterias, etc., or those having outdoor performances, you really need to get the name and number of people attending. If it is a group, then take the name and number of a key person leading the group. And this is in case that um, there's a COVID-19 outbreak. If that happens, it doesn't mean that you close your organization, but you're able to work with NHS and their test entries. Now, in terms of GDPR, you only need, I said, the name and the number and keep those details for 21 days, then destroy or delete them completely, but you cannot use them for marketing or anything like that. Um, and finally, before handing over to our esteemed panel, 
to introduce themselves and give a brief overview of today's webinar. I just need to add that Dance Studios open on 25th July. That's another complicated bit area there. So perhaps we look at that one at some other time. Now it's over to Jasmine, Nick, and Roger in that order, please. Hi everybody, Jasmine Chalice here. Um, I'm, oh, could we go back a slide please, Erin? I'm going to need to talk a little bit further, thank you. Um, so I'm a registered dietitian and nutritionist. I work in a lot of different uh, dance schools and colleges um, and have worked with companies and one-to-one -one dancers. So I would guess I've got a freelance hat. I'm focusing on nutrition. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more thanks to that really helpful um, introduction, Chris, that was fantastic. I've got a couple of extra points on the risk assessment and responsibility um, to add to that, and then we'll have a little look at face masks before I hand on to the next speaker. Um, so again, this is England only, as Chris has so well said, uh, and opening and safe use might well vary, so that if there's a change in local situation, for example, Leicester, uh, then the accessibility of buildings is um, likely to change. So if a, if a building opens up, it may not stay open and it's about keeping up to date with what's happening in individual areas. The web link here, if you follow it through, there's some really useful and fairly readable, the UK documents, uh, sorry, the England documents from the government are relatively legible. Um, as Chris mentioned, the building controller, and sometimes that's used intermingling with manager, um, has the discretion for safety. Um, and at all times, legislation overrides all the guidance that's on the websites. And the legislation is under the health and safety executive. So there's guidance and there's legislation. Um, and they should coincide, but if at any time the guidance clashes with the legislation, legislation wins. Um, so the manager has the discretion for opening a building uh, consistent with core public guidelines, including social distancing, which, is, which Chris has mentioned. The building controller has to do a COVID specific risk assessment. That's a legal requirement in addition to the other risk assessments that they'll have. And as I read the, the um, guidance, 30 people maximum um, in an area if the building is COVID-19 secure. Uh, so as uh, Chris mentioned, it's avoiding pinch points. How are you going to manage, and manage your pinch points? How do you manage your toilets? How do you manage corridors? Uh, how do you manage entrances and exits? You need to look at that. You need to think about timings. So if you are the building controller, that is your responsibility. If you're a user or a hirer of a building, that becomes your responsibility when you are when you have control of the premises. So it's not going, oh, actually, it's the building manager's responsibility. When you're hiring, you have to manage your own risks and carry out your own risk, risk assessment um, and regular cleaning. I think we're going to come on to when we get as far as either Nick or Roger. OK, could we have the face covering slide, please? So uh, as we have here, while the use of face coverings is not mandated in the various guidance relevant to the dance sector, and the two references there are really useful to read and not, and not overly difficult. Um, it is recommended that you consider using them in indoor public spacing when social distancing isn't possible. And really, really important to remember that face coverings don't replace social distancing. You need to continue to wash your hands regularly and to maintain social distancing whenever possible. And to use face coverings appropriately, which means washing your hands before you put them on, putting it on, not touching the face covering while it's on, changing it when it's damp, um, getting rid of it appropriately. So either if it's, if it's disposable, it goes in a, safely into a bin. If it's washable, wash in accordance with the manufacturer's advice. And then when you've disposed of it, wash your hands again. And just to note that face coverings shouldn't be used for under threes and they're not essential for children under 11. 
that's the two different bits of guidelines. So they definitely shouldn't be used by children under three. And when we're going out and about, they're not essential for children under 11. But I didn't find anything that says they couldn't be used. Uh, plus, of course, specific groups, uh, those with uh, a physical or mental illness, impairment or disability, that means they cannot put on, wear or remove it uh, safely. Um, so those, those three links are very readable and I'll now ha hand over to Nick to talk further about cleaning, his favourite topic. I'm, I'm not even going really to rise to that. So we're just talking a little bit about what cleaning is required uh, before reopening. And the headline for this is all surfaces, common touch points need to be cleaned on a regular basis. And you're absolutely fine using standard, usual kind of cleaning products. So I think that's a fundamental thing to think about. Uh, there is obviously a slight difference if you're actually having to clean a, uh, an area that you've had a known or a suspected case of COVID-19, there is some specific guidance. That specific guidance will walk you through the use of uh, combined detergent disinfectant solutions, and that will help you do that. I think is as you're starting to think about your reopening and you're thinking about your processes for your cleaning and what you're going to do for your common touch areas and then what you need to do and be ready for if you've had a suspected case of COVID-19, it's probably worth thinking about if somebody starts to feel unwell in your premises, where are they going to go so that you don't have them interacting with too many people and that you've got a simple solution in regards to your cleaning process because you know where they've been and where they're going to be exiting the building when they leave. I think the other big thing of before reopening is obviously looking at your uh, cleaning procedures because it will be more stringent and more regular than you've had previously. Looking at where your hand sanitizers are so as people walking into your building there's a hand sanitizer available hand sanitizers before you go into uh, various parts of your building to ensure that those common touch points are not becoming a problem all the way through. Uh, checking your ventilation systems as already been mentioned obviously what we want is as much uh, through flow of air and natural air from windows and those sort of things is a, uh, uh, a big area to be considering as part of that reopening. Um, are we ready to move on to Roger? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you Roger. Okay. Hi, so I'm uh, Dr. Roger Wolman. Um, I am a consultant in rheumatology and sport and exercise medicine and have run uh, dance medicine clinics over several years and work with a range of different uh, dance companies. Um, so I'm uh, providing medical advice and guidance for the uh, uh, Dance UK um, and One Dance, and uh, I'm part of the Nidham, Nidham's committee. Um, so uh, I just reiterate what uh, um, Nick has already said, and uh, as you can see on this slide. Um, there's the issues are reg regarding uh, 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 increasing hand washing and making use of hand sanitizers, uh, avoiding sharing uh, personal items uh, and disinfecting shared equipment, really, really important. Uh, as we know, the virus can last on, on a whole range of different uh, structures for many hours. Uh, and that can be variable depending on the type of the structure, depending on the temperature, of the environment depending uh, on the humidity. So all these things can have an influence, but one should regard the, the risk of uh, the virus remaining on objects, whether it's the floor, whether it's door handles, uh, whether it's items of equipment, um, and therefore the importance of regular cleaning can't be stressed enough. Um, so those are the important things and therefore non-sharing of, equi uh, of equipment is, is absolutely key to that. 
Next slide. And then the next feature is if you are going to have uh, 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 groups of uh, dancers uh, in a studio or students in a studio, having opportunity to clean in between those uh, those uh, episodes of dance activity to uh, maintain uh, uh, minimal exposure to the virus, and that's really really important. So having uh, uh, the room empty and uh, different organisations, and depending on what the what those organisations do, may need to uh, have that room empty for longer or shorter, depending depending on what's been going on. The other thing is about natural ventilation being clearly the most effective way of keeping uh, the virus at bay. So opening doors, opening windows, and if uh, any uh, rooms are occupied for a sustained period of time, having that ventilate, natural ventilation passing through is really, really important. So I think that's as much as I need to say at this stage, and I think that we're now happy as a group to take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Well, we've had a number of questions coming in. Um, I'm trying to look at here. I mean, does anybody, I don't know if the panel, if you're actually scrolling down some of these questions and if there are any that you would like to answer, but I can raise one here from Lisa Fitzpatrick that's asking, do risk assessments need signing off after every class? Um, Jasmine, do you want to take that or shall I take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start it and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Um, that, uh, as far as I'm aware that once you've done a risk assessment unless something changes you've you've got it documented and you keep it on file and it stays on file to be amended in the light of change of developments is that your thought as well Chris? Yeah exactly it is more of an I mean while it's a practical thing to do it's also an administrative document so once you've you fill it and you, you, you've completed it and you hold it yes you start that until until it becomes out of date. So no, you don't need to do it after every class. Um, are there any other questions that anyone is seeing here? I'll just, um, somebody's asking, are visors safer or as safe as masks for the teacher? And that's one for Nick or Roger. Nick, do you want to go on this one? Well, uh, it's, obviously this is, this is a, respiratory virus so what we're looking to do is we're looking to stop the asymptomatic spread of the the patient who has coronavirus but doesn't know it expiring uh, and, and actually you know releasing viral load so a mask that covers over the nose and over the mouth is going to be ideal what's been encouraging is that uh, the Royal Ballet Company English National Ballet and Scottish Ballet uh, have all started back in the studios and the reports we've had back so far is it's working really well so uh, so in that regard I think I'm quite pleased that this is a more practical way of actually delivering uh, a, a degree of risk mitigation within the studio environment particularly because we're going to have higher expiration rates so I'm you know as far as I'm concerned I'm happy to stick with masks okay great um this this is one that I find interesting actually and ask, can you clarify the spacing needed for dance classes in a hired community hall, please? Two meter per child with one meter around them. And plus, how does this relate to the airflow area of the hall? Um, does anybody want, to, want to, to answer that? The idea of two meters, is it two meters this way and or two meters in circumference? Uh, well, <laughs> I would, one has got to look at various factors with regard to this and uh, uh, what we're talking about is mitigating risk. We can't completely 100% remove all risk of, of transmission. All we can do is try and reduce that risk and we've got to look at various factors which can enhance viral transmission and clearly the the even at three meters, there is a small risk that you may transmit the virus. That risk gets higher if you go to two meters and it gets higher if you go to one meter. It also gets higher if the uh, person is breathing very deeply and very uh, rapidly because they're ex excreting more breath 
and together with that if they are a, an asymptomatic uh, carrier of the virus they will be transmitting the virus as well so if you are doing an exercise class which is high intensity with uh, lots of people short of breath while they're doing it and that's going to transmit it much more than say a half a yoga class where everyone's moving very very slowly and breathing at a much slower rate also if you're in a hall which has got incredibly high ceilings or a hall which has got open windows and open doors so there's a constant flow of air those risks will go down so there's no absolute uh, uh, measurement which is going to say no risk versus a uh, smaller measurement which is going to say complete risk it's all about risk mitigation and so ideally two to three meters and we, we were saying in, uh, in the various discussion groups we've had if you've got a group of uh, uh, performers who are doing a high intensity exercise class uh, where there's very little data out there on that apart from some minor research done from Norway but we from a safety perspective are saying that ideally it should be three meter gap between the various participants if they're all breathing rapidly and that that distance can come down if they, then they're doing slower type exercise classes or if there is better ventilation in the room where they are exercising so it's all a matter of just a risk assessment and understanding uh, having a, a logical understanding of what how those risks are transmitted into real real dangers okay and I'll just add Chris I'll just add one more thing there is that uh, the government have commissioned uh, research on the aerobiology of coronavirus, particularly how it pertains to our sector. So a large bit of that work is, is going to be based around wind and brass and singing, but we are looking at the aerobiology. So as, as a lot of us have said very early on, it's just it's an evolving science. There's not a, lot of not a lot of strong evidence and data out there to rely on, but the results of the research that has been commissioned is likely to be released in the next week or two. So we're hoping to see that. So we may find some of those guidance do change uh, as, as we see some more research come out supporting uh, a stance for whether or not we need to consider three meters for indoor activities where high expiration rates are. Similar to what's been advocated at the moment for wind and brass, but not quite maybe as far as they've been advocated for singing, which is six meters. Could okay. I just say very briefly that um, it was also, it's also it's a very practical thing. So it's not a case of measuring your entire space, dividing it by the number of people and saying that they've got three square metres. It's actually about people on the ground. Have they got that space between them in practice? All right. And I was going to bring this back to you, Jasmine, because as Nick just mentioned, the idea of singing wind and brass, which is, I mean, we haven't mentioned that up front, but it is one of the exceptions right now in terms of everything else is open. But certainly for non-professionals, that's, I don't think that's allowed yet. And it's only for professionals, but with that three meter distance that you're saying, Nick, do you, do you want to add to that, Jasmine? I, I think it's that dancers are only going to be in, in, in certainly in, in anywhere um, that there isn't explicit agreement for it. So in a regular dance school, you don't want to be singing and dancing. It's just dancing at this point. Yeah, exactly. Anything. And, and also part of the guidance that for, uh, outdoor performances as well is trying to encourage people not to make contact not any type of communal dancing or anything like that as well and uh, also encouraging people not to raise their voices now somebody someone asked a question about if there was no ventilation would an air purifier do so i don't know if anybody wants to address that or i don't think that's going to have a covid filter in it somehow so I think the answer is it's not going to be any more use. I think it's actually getting proper airflow through is what you need. Fresh air going through unless you had some ability to filter air that would filter out COVID viruses. All right, good. I guess in some cases it, it actually is useful to just hear, no, that won't do. Um, so thanks for that. Another question, do you need to wash floors if they are outdoors between sessions? For example, in an outdoor open sided marquee. So there's lots of factors, I think, that influence uh, how long the virus remains. <clears throat> the virus doesn't like high humidity and doesn't like uh, bright sunlight. So um, although I don't know the absolute length of time it would remain on a concrete 
concrete ground, the risk is going to be less if there if there is a, a breeze, if there is a, if it's very sunny, and if it's very humid, uh, compared to colder, drier weather. Um, so that's I think all I can add. And then Nick, have you got anything else to add to that? What I was going to say when when we think about common touch points. I think one of those things we've got to be aware of is that dancers will sit on, you know, whether or not it's indoors or outdoors, they'll sit on the floor when they're stretching. Uh, so even if they're not doing floor work per se, I think it's got to be one of these areas that we look at that is going to be a recipient of viral load. The virus kind of gets expired and then it just drops to the floor. So, you know, it would seem logical that that is one of those common areas that might be a source of transmission in our environment so i would encourage people and i know from birmingham royal ballet company's point of view we have protocols that our studio floors are cleaned between sessions we're allocating an hour between between use of studios and i know we can we've got more studios perhaps than most uh, in order to ensure that it's uh, both covid ready and then it's safe to use so it's not wet and it's not a slippery surface as well Okay, thank you. Um, this one, I, I guess, is also one that, that repeats itself or frequently asked for sure. And what is the advice in relation to teachers in fixed groups? So one teacher that might be working across a number of groups, what is the advice there? And how to so manage that? I was going to say, so the idea behind the fixed groups uh, from, from the government's point of view is uh, it's they, they recognized, and this was part of the original working for the professional sector. And I know there is, there is some uh, contention of what constitutes a professional dancer. But from, the, from trying to kickstart the professional sector again, they recognized that we would get to a point where we would no longer be able to socially distance. And so if we can't socially distance because of a pas de deux or some, some other aspect of the choreography that doesn't allow it, in order to mitigate risk further, we will ask them to put the dancers into fixed groups. So in regards to a teacher, if the teacher is socially distanced from the rest of the group, then that is a means of mitigation. If they're not able to socially distance because they're actually working very tangibly with those dancers, they become part of that fixed group and they cannot then travel between fixed groups. Right. Okay, good. And perhaps, perhaps that goes some way to answering as well to someone asking, if I have three studios, am I able to have three separate bubbles in the building at one time if using a one-way system? Well, yes, you can. You absolutely can, as long as you're not the one that's going along popping the bubbles because you're going inside more than one. Okay, good. Popping bubbles, I like that. <laughs> yes, that makes it kind of clear. Um, well, somebody was asking as well, uh, let me see, because this brings up the issue of... of insurance would it be possible for my pupils to wear masks while they're dancing i guess we we'll dealt with that and if yes what would be the health and insurance implications um i can take a bit on the insurance i think unless anybody wants to add anything um i know there's there are lots of questions going around and uh, it, it is an issue as to what is happening with insurance my guess would be, because we know at the point when lockdown happened, a lot of companies were caught out because their insurance policies, while it might have spoken about force majeure, they suddenly re, um, recanted on that and said, well, this doesn't cover a virus, so it doesn't cover that. And there actually were some areas where virus uh, was mentioned. But I don't know of any insurance company that's actually come, come good and, and made good to anyone who's, who's um, tried to claim under COVID-19. So for me, I would think, without really discussing with the insurance sector, um, I would think that perhaps you need to talk to your broker rather than relying on the policy that you, you have now. And assuming that it will work, I think you need to talk to your broker to see if you need to, to make any additions and perhaps look at you, and it probably might affect your premium. But that's what I would, would really recommend across the board for insurance. And one of the things that, um, I think when we were pressing the government as well for support um, in terms of reopening, one of the things was that they would be would address the insurance sector more clearly, so that there would be correct cover. And I'm not sure if that has happened. I certainly haven't seen it in any in any guidance or anything else. Nick, you have an addition. I, I can say that uh, Julian from UK Theatre and Salt is talking to Lloyd's and trying to understand the insurance further. 
and and saying exactly that is that where we sat as a, as a sector because of this and i think with the exception of wimbledon everybody was caught short of it so uh, so i think it is something that's been looked at but i don't think there's any answers that's come back just yet yeah and that's the thing i know people will keep asking over and over what should i do with insurance yes you need to have your liability insurance but in terms of if it's related to covid i would i would start from really healthy skepticism and think i need to talk to my broker and rather than relying on on the sense that the policy will cover you anyway i would go back to the broker and say what else do i need to do to to, to be sure jasmine yeah and i think the other thing would be just making sure that you've got all the risk assessments in place that you followed all the guidance because if you haven't got that in place i think the insurers will probably run very fast in the opposite direction yes that's really very good addition as well thank you for that um i'm Again, looking through questions. Uh, somebody's asking, is contact improvisation and partner work allowed? Again, that would be that would be the idea of a fixed group. So in a professional environment, uh, they have allowed that within the uh, current phases at this stage, uh, but it's only to be taking place within a fixed group. So once you've moved into that space, that becomes that fixed group and you can't cross uh, between it. And with that in mind, if you pick up uh, an injury, you can't replace somebody from another fixed group into that. So that would be breaching it. And so just be mindful of that. And when you do move into the sector uh, of, of the sort of your, your artistic uh, delivery, with test and trace, the reason for the fixed groups is to try to uh, ring fence who's going to be liable for isolation if you have an outbreak. And so if you're moving into this time earlier than you need to, be mindful of the risk is that if somebody picks it up, you're going to lose that whole bubble. Uh, whereas if you can work in a socially distanced position for longer until you absolutely need to, you're reducing your risk of both uh, spreading the virus, but the impact it may have on your business as well. All right, great. That's perfect because there is, I mean, a lot of the questions are pretty much up on the base of can you mix? And I think it's, it's trying to find ways around having a fixed group and, and working towards that. Either ways to introduce someone new into the group, into the fixed team or the bubble, or from one person to, for one person to move to the next. And I think it is becoming clearer and clearer that that's not a very good thing to do. Not a very good idea. So, and, and please remember everyone that your risk assessment is something that that you have to consider on uh, with the best information that you have and with, with the, well, I suppose with the information facing and the knowledge and other experience that is facing you and make a proper judgment. And I would think that the basis of your judgment is, would you like this to happen to you? So, you know, no matter which way you swing it, you know, you have to make it as safe as possible. And I think in lots of ways, once you read the guidance, it is pretty clear. Jasmine, did you want to come in on something? So is that a spot that you're muted? Um, no, I think you've covered that really well. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, sorry, I'm just trying to go through the questions, but I say they are, they are pretty, pretty much looking at, at how um, things can shift. How does an amateur dance school have fixed groups when some students do one class a week and eight others do eight or 10, and they are all different ages and grades? That's one question. Um, same as community practitioner in contact with a wide range of children and adults groups, I'm concerned about the contact we have. In addition to putting in practice social distancing, airflow and common touch points, should we be wearing visors? I think we've addressed that. Can, the dan can dancers travel across the space or do they need to stay within a fixed two meter area? Okay, um, oh, this is another one. Maybe somebody would want to, to, to perhaps look at this. Do we need to show a clear marked box stuck to the floor or can we use spaced markers as we have to remove each time as our venues are multi-purpose? Yeah, well, I think there's no reason why you can't just use uh, space markers because when you start to get into centre work and different work, it's 
the reason for the markers on the floor is to create the awareness. You know, the signage is actually very useful and a good reminder uh, that social distancing is our, is our strongest mitigation. It's, it's certainly one of the reasons why face masks uh, were, were discussed at length because it gives people the false sense of, of protection. So I think, you know, having temporary markers is absolutely fine, but it's about reiterating that social distancing, you know, either if you're working against, you know, working at the bar or if you're in centre, be mindful of where you are and the space around you. Yeah. Um, and someone is asking here about, uh, about the use of fans. I know we mentioned that before, that the air purifier probably wouldn't be the best thing, but I'm sure that some in the guidance, they do mention the use of fans about Im improving um, ventilation, or I might be wrong. Does anyone want to, to look at that? I mean, I'll just pick up, I think, unless you've actually got fresh air, new air coming through, it's, it's not really going to be any benefit having a fan. Moving moist air around that may already have COVID in it is better than uh, just leaving the air closer to wherever person it was at the time. Except the only reason it might be if you've got a very high ceiling in the studio ah. and then it, uh, you dilute the effect of the, of the virus at, mm -hmm. uh, at uh, uh, body level and that might be a reason for doing it but uh, I agree with Jasmine that the uh, important thing is to have airflow going through it and if you then use a fan then you're going to get an be even better flow of air through the studio. Okay um, someone says here as I understand it dance conservators are allowed well we don't know if this is true or not true are allowing contact dance classes again maybe from September with students in fixed groups, but these individuals don't live together and may use public transport to attend class. Can we then assume that we can start professional rehearsals without the cast needing to do 14 days isolation in advance of moving, of moving in residentially together? So in regards to the professional environment, yes, this, the phases that we're at at the moment does allow us to get into, as we said earlier on, a position that is no longer socially distant. So that would be contact work, part of the, something like that. It may not necessarily always fit the artistic vision to pair households together. You know, we've had this discussion with our artistic director where we've got husband and wife that they just, they, they won't be part of a, uh, of a particular fixed group. And so we understand that as a risk. And so we understand that if I have a dancer who is in a particular fixed group who demonstrates or has a positive test for coronavirus, I will need to self-isolate the rest of that group. If that particular dancer then lives with another dancer, that dancer will also likely to be in a socially uh, distanced compromised position and they will need to isolate. And so it's those sort of instances that are part of risk mitigation rather than risk elimination. Right. Okay. And this one, when teaching, should the teacher face away from the students, have their back to the students? Again, where possible, because when we expire, it's about viral load. And, and exactly what Roger was saying with the, uh, with the fans is that the amount you expire in front, if you're face to face, then you're increasing viral load. This may not be possible all the time, but if you can demonstrate in front of them at a socially distanced position with your back to the rest of the class you're reducing the viral load for the rest of the class and that could be considered a means of mitigation as well okay and this one might be for anyone who can answer it how does a community dance practitioner protect themselves legally and medically when working on behalf of multiple contractors will their insurance be sufficient will they be able to claim sickness support if forced into quarantine Does anyone want to take that? I suppose the means of protecting oneself is to follow the guidelines as they stand at the moment. So from a medical and a, a health point of view, you, you continue to self uh, to, to socially distance. You can ensure that you're not the one spreading it by wearing a mask. In regards to where you sit with your insurance, I'm afraid, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, because, I mean, if you are a freelancer, and definitely not an employee or worker, then you will probably not be entitled to statutory sick pay. It'll be up to the, um, 
to whoever you're working for to, to, to perhaps have the good grace to do something like that. But it will, um, you probably will not, not be entitled to that. And if you do need to, to, to take a break, you'd have to look at, at universal credit, um, which would be my guess. What else do we have here? Um, Asking somebody's asking about where they can find resources on insurances and which kind of insurance should I need if I employ three or four freelance dancers? Um, okay, I mean, just answering that very quickly. If you're, you're employing, then you're definitely going to need um, employer's liability and you need to, to, to show an employer liability certificate, an updated one, every year in your office or wherever your employees operate. So that's one type of insurance that you need. It tends to come in a comprehensive package. So if you have an office and i know offices are going out of style very quickly these days as we talk they might disappear before we even finished on this call um you know you can get a, a, a package of which will cover contents um financial disruption employers liability all that will be part of it as well so you can talk to an employer about that uh, sorry talk to an insurance company about that and that's where you probably will will you will need insurance in, in that regard, particularly if you have um, employees. Um, okay, I'm looking, does anyone see any qu interesting questions as well? Sorry, it's just rushing through this up and down and out this q and is quite difficult actually. I was just going to chip in because I was just doing a quick look up on the sanitizers because um, there was a question about sanitizers and children and I'm sure either Nick or Roger can probably uh, add in as well but as I understand it to be effective the recommendation is a sanitizer is at least 70% alcohol and the main thing with children is making sure they don't drink it and do not do anything other than sanitize their hands with a very tiny amount um, and then in terms of being sensitive to it uh, maybe Roger could could add into that one sorry Roger Uh, no, I think I think you've covered that pretty well, um, uh, and with all the provisos you mentioned. So yeah, I, I, nothing else to add. Okay, and somebody's asking if studios have no windows on natural air circulation, should classes not take place there? So I would have thought it's all about, uh, as we've said, all about risk mitigation. And clearly that is not an ideal situation. So one alternative way of mitigating the risk, well, one absolute way of mitigating the risk is having no one in the room. And one less uh, uh, effective way of mitigating is to have a smaller number of people in the room. So if you would uh, normally with a ventilated room be observing say three meter, the three meter rule, and, uh, and then you've got a room with no ventilation whatsoever, then maybe you should be looking at four meters or six meters as we say we have no absolute figures there isn't the research out there but it's just using that sort of common sense approach so that uh, less people should be in a room which has no ventilation compared to a similar size room with plenty of rent ventilation great thank you Chris, can i can i jump in on on one um there have been a couple of questions about traveling in the space. And um, I think that's quite an interesting question. And um, on Friday, we'll be looking at social distancing in dance classes specifically. So we'll have an entire session which is devoted to social distancing and how dance classes can be structured to ensure social distancing and the possible implications of what Nick was talking about before, which is, um, aerosols and movement um, and we'll we'll be addressing that in depth on Friday but perhaps Nick you can specify what we know and don't know about traveling and aerosol distribution is there still uh, a lot to be determined as a study of these research that we're doing to use the MS and a few different processes as part of those so sorry Nick Nick, your uh, voice is a little bit strange. Do you want to try one more time? Sorry, is that much better? Uh, not much better. Nick, you sound like a Dalek, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's what I was thinking myself. <laughs> no. Uh, sorry about that. No, no idea what's going on. 
No, um, it, might, it might come back to us in, in a while. Yeah, um, I think ultimately yeah. we, we don't know very much about that as yet. There have been some studies that have looked at that in running and um, there have been some interesting uh, uh, visualizations of how aerosols uh, travel behind people who are running. Um, but obviously there isn't any direct research in dance as yet about how aerosols move as people move. Okay. All right. Should I'm I just add in, I think that, that adds in with the question about the sort of the visors versus masks is that does anybody really know where the air goes? Because it's obviously if it's not being going through a mask, if it's for a visor, it's going to be moving either the side or up, up above or below from a, from a visor. Yeah, which is just what a question that we had. So, sorry, can I can I just come in on that? Because I think um, you, uh, Jasmine's right. I mean, with the visor, then you dilute the effect because the the, the ex exhaled breath gets spread out over a wider area to either side. The the studies that have been done on uh, on uh, cyclists and on runners is that one of the worst things to do is to go directly behind a cyclist. Uh, or directly behind a runner because you then run into their space or cycle into the space where the person exhaled. So the same would apply really with dance. So if you're in a dance class and people are moving across and one dancer is following in the line of a, of a dancer in front of them, then they're gonna walk or dance straight into the uh, space where the viral load has been exhaled. So avoiding those direct straight line following one dancer following another is an also another aspect where you can mitigate the risk and that's just something for for the uh, the teachers to try and work out how they can minimize that effect okay and because this is what sarah actually is asking is asking exactly the same thing about the idea of, of face shield funneling the virus downwards or the airflow downwards and she's also going on to say it's, if all of my pupils are wearing a face mask or shield would we be able to dance closer than two meters apart and she's also has ballroom and latin couples class and they tend to dance with their partners um if they all wear masks would we be able to run a group class I, th I think Shah, uh, while, while Nick's attempting to sort his Dalek voice, I think what he would probably say is that uh, this is this is about mitigating risk and the whole part, point about is you have as much spacing as possible and if people have got to get closer then a mask mitigates that risk but there is no zero risk. You don't know if somebody is is a carrier and doesn't yet know it um, and so it's actually trying to avoid transmission of this virus. And of course, another important facet to all of this, if we look thinking about the wider population of people dancing, then if you carry any of the comorbidities, which may increase your risk of having a severe COVID disease, that would be, you know, obesity, diabetes, chronic uh, lung disease, asthma, all these sort of things, then you've got to take the uh, risk mitigation more seriously uh, because the, if you get exposed to the virus, you're likely to have a much more severe disease if you've got any of those comorbidities. So that's just another factor that each individual needs to take into account when they're deciding what level of risk they're prepared to accept. Okay, great. Um, Carla is asking, do you have any advice about outdoor shoes and dance spaces? About which shoes, sorry? Outdoor shoes. So I suppose coming in, coming up, coming inside from outside with, with the shoes that you're wearing, perhaps to travel in. If there's any advice on that. I would have thought it's fairly low risk. Roger? Well, yeah, I would have thought that as well, Jasmine. But um, I read a report uh, probably about six weeks ago that, that they'd looked at the viral load on people's shoes and they're surprisingly high. Now, whether those the viral load on the shoes were viruses which were virulent and active in terms of disease transmission uh, was unclear but uh, it just shows you that uh, if you look hard enough for this virus it's it's in a lot of places and so maybe maybe we should be cleaning our shoes when we come indoors uh, having said that that doesn't happen when you go into hospitals so uh, um, 
you know, we, we've just got to be sensible about this, I think. I think there's also something to be recognized that um, floors are high touch surfaces in dense spaces. So just like a door handle is a high touch surface or a, um, a, an object is a highly touched surface, the floor is often touched. And this is especially important when we're thinking about floor work or environments where people will be dancing on the floor. So if you're in a situation where people are touching the floor quite frequently or doing any floor work, it may be worth as a precaution removing outdoor shoes before coming into a dance space and ensuring that you clean the floor well between individuals who are using the space and that you also provide hand sanitizer for anyone who will be likely to be touching the floor. Okay, great. And perhaps we can squeeze one more question, and this is just really to, to clear up the idea of, again, fixed teams and bubbles. And somebody's asking if they've been social distancing from each child or each participant by at least two meters, can they swap bubbles? No, Nick, maybe. Is, is, is my mic okay? okay. It, it's, it's not much better, but I, I'm not sure if you have a loose cable or, or something. Uh, but say, if you are within a socially distanced position. So if you're outside of that, you're not a part of the bubble. So if you're, if you're two meters outside of, of the fixed team, then you're not part of the bubble. Is that what you're saying? So you can actually move from team to team as long as you maintain that two meters distance from whoever you're, you're um, dealing with. Yes, but obviously the more that you interact with them, and then the higher that risk becomes, becomes so the reducing the viral load is about staying away from them uh, uh, as far as possible, and, and you take money own around, around asymptomatic patients, and viral transmission in an indoor environment with exercise and individuals. So that mitigation, you, you don't want to be the one, the one responsible for moving it from one part to another. Yeah, so I guess in those, those instances, um, as you're saying, Nick, as we can just hear, as you're speaking from the bottom of a well, um, <laughs> we can hear that in fact what, what it is, is that in those instances, keep mitigating, mitigating the risk as much as possible, and those other things will come in, like reducing the time of the activity, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that you can mitigate it. Um, Erin, I'm handing back to you, because I think we're out of time. And just briefly to say thank you to everyone for joining in. Thanks to the panel as well. You're brilliant, always an incredible fount of knowledge, so we're eternally grateful. And thanks to you, Ali, and everyone who's joined us. Wonderful. Erin. So just to say thank you again um, to all of you for joining, and as Chris said, to our brilliant panel. Um, just to remind everyone that we have some upcoming webinars. So on Friday at 1 p.m., our topic will be social distancing in dance and in that session we're going to be looking in depth at fixed groups and bubbles, indoor exercise, ventilation and face covering. So we've talked a lot about that today but we'll have more time to talk about it on Friday because clearly it's still something that we need to discuss and, and to uh, kind of help come up with as many answers as we can in this situation. Also on the 22nd of July, which is next Wednesday, we're going to be talking about considerations for vulnerable groups, including BAME and disabled people. On Friday, the 24th of July, we'll be speaking about social distancing, specifically looking at different dance activities, such as contact and floor work, and the risks that those activities might um, uh, include. We'll also be talking about class structure and uh, looking at how we can plan uh, classes effectively. We're also gonna be planning future webinars to cover working with children and young people, working as a freelancer, trying to think of alternatives to face-to-face -face activity, including outdoor activity, blended learning, and addressing digital poverty. We'll be speaking about transport, touring, and travel, and physical and mental preparation for returning to dance. So thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you at our next